There's no question in my mind that, you know, EUS is a very integral part uh, of our toolbox. It's just, it's just an imaging procedure. It, it's, it's no different than endoscopy or fluoroscopy when we do ERCP. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I think they're in the future, uh, if you want to do interventional endoscopy, you have to um, uh, have a solid foundation in EUS. So I'm going to focus on EUS-guided vascular therapy. We'll talk about coils, glue, and beyond. I do have this disclosure. Uh, I'm the founder and CMO of Exlumina, and the product I'll be discussing is Axios, but it will be for an off-label use to create a TIPS procedure. So that's a little bonus at the very end. Now, really EUS-guided vascular therapy is an extension of what we really do every day. Um, we identify uh, tumors, uh, for example, in the pancreas. Uh, we flip on the uh, Doppler, look for uh, vessels, identify those uh, vessels. Uh, then we target the lesion with our FNA needle. But now, instead of aspirating through our FNA needle, we can inject a solution, be it a sclerosant or cyanoacrylate glue, or we can deploy a, a coil. And the structure that we're targeting is a vessel. And these are vessels that can be within the wall or they can be outside the wall. So why EUS-guided vascular uh, therapy? What's, what's the, what are the advantages? Well, I think if you ask any interventional radiologist, uh, they will tell you how important it is to be able to see and target the vessel lumen. That's something we may see endoscopically, but usually we really don't see it. Um, so A, we can clearly define the vessel lumen. Second, we can often identify the feeder vessel. So we're gonna be more effective in our therapy if we can identify that vessel which is feeding often the more superficial vessels that are seen endoscopically. And we can confirm vessel obliteration after our treatment. But I think also of great importance uh, for the endoscopist is the ability to maintain vision. Uh, we can use EUS independent of our endoscopic visualization. It's not just an issue of food debris or residue, for example, in the stomach or blood clots from a prior bleed that may impair your visualization. Remember that when we perform um, uh, endoscopic uh, um, uh, hemostasis, we can, we can actually trigger or worsen the bleeding. And this is one example here. This is a, a gastric varix uh, that I had just punctured to inject glue, and I actually triggered this avalanche bleed here, and within seconds, the view was gone. Uh, and this is where it's, of course, very nice if you can switch to ultrasound to see that bleeding vessel. Well, it was Paul Falkins that actually first uh, described the use of EUS to detect and actually uh, treat a Dulafois lesion. And this is uh, 1996, so it's, it's almost two decades ago. And he used the radial scanning echoendoscope. Um, it's pretty amazing that using that radial scanning echoendoscope, which as you know, it produces an imaging plane which is perpendicular to the axis of the endoscope, so your needle is only going to appear as a dot in your field. But he was able to actually treat uh, in three patients, uh, injecting the sclerosant, identify the Dilfois lesion, uh, and treat it. In eight patients, he was able to nicely visualize that penetrating uh, vessel characteristic of a Dulafois. And it was Michael Levy, uh, our chairman here, who first described, and this is then about a decade after that, in 2008, first uh, described what uh, I think is just a beautiful name, EUS-guided angiotherapy. Now, this is using our curved linear array uh, echoendoscope. So these are five patients. They all had refractory bleeding. In fact, they had all failed at least three prior attempts at endoscopic therapy. And uh, he and his group were able to successfully treat uh, these five lesions. And you'll note there was uh, uh, one uh, Dilafois lesion, uh, two GIST lesions, a duodenal ulcer, and then he had a hemosuchus pancreaticus as well. 
And now, uh, a few years later, a, a French group, a Marc Barthes group, they uh, uh, posed the question, U.S.-guided vascular therapy, is it safe and effective? And their conclusion, it's only eight patients, but they concluded that it is safe and it is effective. And these are eight patients, five of whom had arterial bleeds, and you can see two of these arterial bleeds were Dilafois ulcers, uh, three variceal bleeds, uh, six of these patients had failed prior endotherapy, and their success rate was very high, and there were no complications. So we're getting more validation of the use of EUS to treat these uh, mostly refractory uh, bleeding lesions. And this is one of uh, my cases from my archives. Uh, I remember this case very well because I had tried virtually every modality I could think of trying to treat this refractory Dulafois uh, bleed. And if you look here, uh, I had used injection therapy, I had used thermal therapy, I had placed multiple clips, had to pull off some of these clips and try more clips. And then finally, as a last resort, I then sprayed cyanoacrylate glue over the surface trying to stop the bleed all to no avail. So I decided to pull out the gastroscope and replace this with an echoendoscope. And this is what I saw. I actually saw the Dulafois artery. This is sort of an aneurysmic uh, penetrating vessel through the wall of the stomach. I could see that beautifully when I switched on my Doppler. And now using a 22 gauge needle, I targeted this uh, vessel, switched off the Doppler now, and you can see the glue actually entering into the vessel lumen. I'm just letting it sort of drip into the lumen, and it solidifies very rapidly. And as it solidifies, it becomes echogenic. So I can confirm that I've really targeted the lumen of this vessel and that I have obliterated this vessel. And here, I switch the Doppler back on, and there's no Doppler signal left. So I was able to successfully treat this very refractory Dilofol lesion, and it's quite remarkable, remarkable how well it was seen, and that's really characteristic of, of a Dilofol lesion. This is another example um, of a refractory bleed. This is an esophageal variceal bleed after the patient had undergone multiple band, attempts at band ligation or multiple band ligations uh, many at uh, other institutions. So here you can see this bleed from uh, a, an esophageal varix. And we switch on the Doppler, and we immediately see the extramural collaterals and that perforating vessel. That is the feeding vessel for that bleeding varix. And in the same manner as you saw with the Dilafois lesion, we're targeting the lumen of the perforator vessel and the bleeding stops completely. And you can see that little glue plug where the glue exited from the puncture site or from the bleed site. Well, it's not just refractory bleeds, though. What about elective treatment of uh, uh, bleeding lesions? Well, this is a, a study from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And at the time, this is 2006, I assume that the uh, that the use of band ligation had not disseminated uh, in this part of the world yet. And uh, these authors did a randomized trial uh, where they compared standard endoscopic sclerotherapy and EUS-guided sclerotherapy targeting what they called the esophageal collateral vein, which is really the perforator uh, vein that they were targeting. So you can see here on this, uh, on this EUS the needle entering into uh, the varix lumen. What they found was in the cohort of patients that underwent EUS-guided injection, there were fewer and later recurrences of variceal bleeding compared with the cohort that underwent conventional sclerotherapy. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was a strong trend in favor. But interesting, when they did a study uh, correlating the persistence of the collateral vessels or visualization of the perforating vessels, they saw that this correlated significantly with uh, the re-bleeding uh, rate. It was Rafael Romero uh, Castro 
um, that first reported the use of the of cyanoacrylate glue injection targeting, again, this concept of the perforating vessel. Um, and Michael Levy had, pre, prior to this, he had reported on the uh, use of, uh, of coils, I think, and ectopic, and we'll talk about that in, in, in just a moment. But uh, what Raphael, uh, his hypothesis was that if we could target the perforating vessel and occlude that vessel, then we may actually be able to achieve obliteration of the gastric varices with a smaller amount of glue. We want to produce the maximal blood flow blockage of the inflow vessel with lower amounts of, C, of, of cyanoacrylate. So this is just five patients, a, a proof of concept studying, study. Uh, they targeted the perforator vessel. They did use a mixture of histoacryl and lipiodol. The mean number of sessions to achieve, achieve obliteration was 1.6, and the mean amount of glue injected was 1.6. And anecdotally, they said that was about half the amount that they usually needed to treat gastric varices using the conventional approach, uh, endoscopic approach. They, have, they had 100% hemostasis and no recurrent bleeding in this small proof-of-concept study. The dreaded complication of glue injection for all of us who do this is embolization. And if you do enough of these, you're going to experience a complication of embolization. And I myself have had one fatality from uh, pulmonary embolization. Um, you can see here a long list of complications. The glue can embolize virtually anywhere. So Rafael, uh, he's from Seville, Spain. He had uh, already published on the targeting of the perforator vessel injecting glue. He then proposed the concept of uh, targeting the perforator vessel with using co uh, coils and eliminating the glue entirely. Could this address this uh, issue of potential embolization. So this is a, uh, a case report of four patients. You used a mean of nine coils per patient, um, ranging from two to 22, so uh, quite a number of coils uh, in, in at least one of the patients, always targeting the perforator vein, and you reported eradication in three or four. And, and as previously mentioned, uh, Michael had also used coils, but targeting, I think, ectopic uh, gastric varices. Um, this is a follow-up study. Uh, it's a little misleading uh, because this is not a randomized trial. So multi-center trial, and they're basically reporting uh, their further experience using coils targeting the perforator vessel to treat gastric uh, fundal varices in 11 patients. Um, and then they compared that historically, so this is not a randomized trial, compared historically with 19 patients who underwent the standard glue uh, injection, but done under uh, U.S. guidance, also targeting the perforator uh, vessels. Of note, they used a mean of six coils per patient, ranging from 2 to 13, and 18% of the patients actually ended up requiring additional glue therapy, so in about a fifth of the patients. There was no lung emboli um, uh, witnessed, uh, and they performed CT scans, and they did mix the, the glue with lipiodol to make it radio, uh, radio opaque. Um, there was no lung embolization, whereas in the cohort of patients that underwent EUS-guided glue injection into the perforator vessel, uh, lung emboli were seen in 47% on the CT scans. Now, these patients were, uh, based on the report, were asymptomatic, but nonetheless, they had evidence of lung emboli. So you can see here the gray bar is complications, 58% of the patients undergoing the glue injection versus 9% in those undergoing uh, coil in, uh, deployment alone. So we've borrowed these coils from the interventional radiologists. Uh, these are synthetic uh, strands, uh, sort of wooly strands that are uh, attached to a metal alloy coil body, be it platinum or nickel. Uh, these differ in their loop diameters, and so that's what you need to pay attention to when you pick a coil. So you're going to pick the coil diameter based on the diameter of the target vessel. 
So if your vessel is eight millimeters, then you want to pick a size that's a little bit larger than that diameter. So these range from two to 20 millimeters in diameter, the loop diameters. And if you want to pass this through a 22 gauge needle, then you uh, need to uh, select a loop diameter up to 10 millimeters. Uh, if you need to pay, place a loop diameter greater than 10 millimeters, then uh, you have to use a 19 gauge needle. The coil lengths range from 10 to 200 uh, millimeters, and the coil length determines the number of loops that are subsequently formed. So you can see here the, the, the number of loops. If you have a uh, 20 millimeter, uh, sorry, 70 millimeter length, then that uh, creates 2.2 loops. And if you have 140 millimeter length, then it's going to uh, create 4.4 loops. So this is the coil insertion technique, uh, five basic steps. First, you puncture the uh, varix with your FNA needle, be it the 22 or the 19, depending on the loop diameter that you're choosing. Uh, you want to confirm blood return through your, uh, your FNA needle, and then you flush your needle clear of blood. You then insert and lure lock the coil introducer to the FNA needle hub, not to the biopsy port of your echoendoscope. You're attaching it to the FNA needle hub. You advance the coil into the FNA needle, and you want to advance the full length of the coil using your stylet until it has entered um, uh, past or extended beyond the introducer itself. You then remove the stylet and the introducer, and you then reintroduce the stylet to advance the coil. So this video shows these five steps. Aspiration, blood return, flush with, with saline or distilled water, depending on what type of glue you're using. Here we're attaching the introducer, the coil introducer, to the FNA needle hub. Right, there's our FNA needle. There's the hub. We're advancing the coil into the FNA needle, the full length of the coil with the stylet. So we want to just make sure that that coil has advanced beyond the introducer into the FNA needle. And then, uh, looks like it stopped here, but after this we'll remove the stylet and the introducer and then we'll reintroduce the stylet to advance. Well, you can see it here. We're reintroducing the stylet to advance the coil through the length of the FNA needle. And that will deploy, of course, into our target site. Here's a quick video uh, showing a bleeding gastric varix. Now we've switched on the Doppler. And uh, we can see the perforator below. So we'll follow that perforator, and we're targeting the perforator, which is down here, with our coil. So we're trying to push that coil into the perforator itself. And the coil is very echogenic, so we can see it deploy inside of the varix lumen very nicely. And if you wanted to only use coils, then you can just advance subsequent coils through the same FNA needle in sequence. And I think this is a very uh, viable option, uh, but my issue with coils uh, are twofold. Number one, um, as mentioned, sometimes you have to place quite a number of coils to achieve obliteration of the varix, up to 22 in Raphael's experience, and these are rather costly. Um, and really the issue that needs to be addressed is avoiding embolization. Glue works very well, we know that. It's got a great history. Uh, dates back to 1986 when Nib Sahendra first described the use of cyanoacrylate glue to treat gastric varices. So we don't necessarily want to abandon the glue, but we want to address the risk of embolization. Well, what if we use the coil as a scaffold to bind the glue and prevent it from embolizing? And so this is sort of a proof of concept that I did ex vivo. I had deployed a coil in this container of uh, heparized blood. Then I injected the glue, and the glue attached to those wooly synthetic fibers attached to the, to, the, uh, to, to the platinum coil. And I was able to remove the whole thing as one conglomerate. And there was no residual glue left in the container. 
So it suggested to me that we can prevent the glue from embolizing into the bloodstream by first placing a coil. So the coil is acting as a scaffold to retain the glue at the site of injection. And this should reduce the flow in the varics, and that, in combination with the coil itself, may contribute to varics obliteration. So this is the technique. We first puncture the varics uh, with our FNA needle. We then deploy our uh, coil, and we'll, we will deploy only one coil. And then we will immediately follow with an injection of the glue through the same FNA needle. We're not removing the needle. We're just following immediately with the glue. And here you can see the appearance a few months later with complete eradication. So let's watch this video here. It's one nice example of a very large fundal varix. Doppler very nicely highlights uh, these, uh, the, the varices. It's a conglomerate of varices. So we used the uh, largest uh, coil diameter that was available. I think it was, in this case, a 20 millimeter. You can see, there it is, 20 millimeter coil. You can see it being delivered into the varix lumen as it um, deploys and coils within the uh, uh, lumen. Um, uh, you can see that, and then we follow immediately with an injection of the cyanoacrylate. And as that cyanoacrylate solidifies, it's very echogenic, and then we'll switch on the Doppler again, and sometimes you'll see that there's a neighboring area that may need to be additionally treated. So here you can see, again, the deployment of another coil, this time a smaller one, a 15 millimeter, because the residual lumen of this neighboring varix is not that large, and then we follow with the glue. And this is the appearance after the coil and glue injection. A minimal amount of bleeding, we're not targeting that varix from the gastric side, but rather more from the esophageal or cardia side. This is the appearance at three months. Both the coil and the glue tend to be extruded uh, as one, uh, one piece. And then uh, we'll usually do EUS. If the patient returns to us, we'll always do EUS to confirm that there are no residual gastric fundal varices. And this is the appearance at nine months follow-up. So compare that with how it looked um, before treatment. Now, there are different glues out there. Um, actually, the cyanoacrylate glue was developed by the Eastman Kodak Company um, as an as a, uh, adhesive. Uh, this is the same super glue that you can buy in the hardware, uh, in the hardware store, uh, alkyl 2 cyanoacrylate. It's too toxic for biologic use. But these are the various glues that are available within the medicinal arena. Um, and uh, as the alkyl chain increases, uh, the histotoxicity decreases. But the polymerization, polymerization time also decreases. Now, I think that's actually, we can use that to our advantage. And you'll note here that the dermabond, which is octo 2 cyanoacrylate, is, it is the least histotoxic, and it has the slowest polymerization time. Um, it is three to four times longer compared to the butyl cyanoacrylate. So the histoacryl, for example, or indermil, those are the N-butyl-2 cyanoacrylates. Um, it uh, has a three- to four-fold longer polymerization, but that also translates to an easier time injecting this. You do not need to dilute it with lipidol. The rationale for the dilution with, with lipidol is to slow that polymerization, so we don't need to do that. But I think also importantly, there's much lower risk to the, uh, to the scope. And you can easily wipe this off the tip of your scope if it happens to come in contact with the scope. You can see here the histoacryl being dropped onto a blood agar plate and the dermabond, and look at the difference in the polymerization time. What this also means is that your method of injection needs to be different. So rather than injecting with high velocity, which you have to do with histoacryl, otherwise it's going to clot in your needle, whether it's your FNA needle or a standard sclerotherapy needle. With the dermabond, you're literally dripping it into the lumen, drop by drop. And I have postulated that is actually that injection with high velocity that may contribute to embolization. 
So although it's often said that the longer, longer polymerization time of dermabon may increase the risk of embolization, I think it may be just the opposite. So the advantages of dermabond are that you can eliminate the lipidol, making the injection easier. It's the lipidol that's viscous. The cyanoacrylate has the same viscosity as water. There is no risk of uh, premature catheter plugging. There's no risk of the needle actually getting stuck in the varix. There have been case reports of that happening, and that can be catastrophic. And there's a lower risk of scope injury. I would argue there's no risk of scope damage because you can flush out the, uh, the channel and you can wipe it off the end of your endoscope very easily. And there's also less risk to the uh, personnel. Uh, we use uh, uh, N-butyl-2 cyanoacrylate. Everyone must wear goggles because there is a risk of the glue spraying into the room because you're injecting it so forcefully and so fast. And if you get it in the eye, you have instantaneously lost your eyesight. So, you know, there's some dangers here that need to be re uh, respected, and it's really about decreasing these uh, risks, not just the embolization risk to the patient, but also the risk to the personnel and your scopes. This is how Dermabond's prepared. It's very easy. This is, you know, used down in the emergency room uh, for uh, uh, to... Uh, repair or, uh, or it, um, approximate uh, the edges of wounds. You use a filter needle. It's important to use a filter needle to aspirate the glue uh, from the, uh, the, the container. We reported our results uh, in our, the first 30 patients. Uh, using a transesophageal or transcardiac uh, approach to gastric fundal varices, all using a combination of coil, one coil, followed then by one aliquot of cyanoacrylate glue injection. And I just want to make an, uh, emphasize that that aliquot, it's important to limit that aliquot to either, if you're using histocryl, to one milliliter. If you're using the dermabond, then two milliliters. The reason why you can use more of the Dermabond is because the Dermabond, uh, the two milliliters is equal to about one milliliter in terms um, of the, um, uh, the obliteration effect that it produces. Our technical success was excellent in these 30 patients. Uh, the mean uh, number of coils uh, used overall for these patients was 1.3. Um, and the mean amount of glue was 1.4 milliliters. Mean follow-up, uh, 193 days. Rebleeding was seen in 17% of patients, and we had no complications. We have now updated our data uh, to 115 patients, of whom 26 underwent primary treatment, so prophylactic treatment. Um, these are all patients with very large gastric fundal uh, varices. Um, we had one... Uh, failure due to technical reasons, basically the same amount of, uh, of, of coil uh, and, and glue injection, a little bit more here. We increase the amount uh, per aliquot. Uh, we have great follow-up in these 115 patients, and our re-bleeding rate has actually now decreased to 9%. Um, now, we had a few patients, four, who complained of postprandial pain after the injection but that was self-limited. Um, and we had one patient who developed a pulmonary embolus, but it was a week after our treatment. So we really questioned whether it, and this is a patient that was hospitalized and very sick, whether that was in any way really related uh, to the uh, glue treatment. So this is sort of an overview of our uh, 115 patients here, 114 uh, technical success, and in 69%, these patients returned to us and had EUS follow-up done by our group. And uh, of that group, uh, we were able to confirm obliteration of gastric fundal varices in 96%. Uh, we had re-bleeding from gastric varices in only 2.6%, only two patients of uh, 76 with long-term follow-up. So really quite encouraging results. We've also used the same technique to treat a very large uh, rectal varices. This is a case report that we published in 2012. You can see this almost looks like a gastric fundal varix, but it's in the rectum. Um, but using the identical 
method, coil first followed by the glue injection. Uh, and this patient also had a great outcome. So in the remaining minutes, uh, let's uh, talk about what might lie uh, beyond. Um, we heard this morning about transgastric, transhepatic biliary drainage, how we're able to very nicely access the left hepatic duct uh, from the proximal uh, stomach. Here you can see a uh, stent draining uh, the left hepatic duct. Well, what about targeting the portal vein um, and the hepatic vein using the same route, transgastric, transhepatic, and potentially performing a TIPS procedure? We know about the drawbacks of a conventional uh, TIPS. Um, there can be local injury because the axis is, as you know, transjugular. That can be the carotid, it can be the trachea, the thoracic duct. There are many sites where injuries can occur. We're passing through the right heart and the intrathoracic IVC. IVC. There, can, there have been reports of perforation and many reports of cardiac complications because you're going through the right heart. And it really is a blind puncture of the portal vein um, from the hepatic vein. There have been reports of perforation, injury to the hepatic artery, leaks, bile duct injury, gallbladder injury, liver capsule injuries. Often the portal vein that is targeted is extrahepatic, so it's not even within the liver. Um, and there have been reports of bleeding and fistulas. The conceptual advantages of a transgastric, transhepatic uh, tips, um, and um, is my time up or do I have a few more minutes? I was, thought it was 30 minutes, no? Okay, right. So direct, it's, it's the direct access to the liver and the vessel. So we're going to target the vessel immediately from the stomach. We can use Doppler ultrasound to guide our treatment. Um, there's the potential for a, a, a shorter procedure time and we can eliminate radiation exposure. And in the setting of acute bleeding, we could even combine this with diagnostic endoscopy. So if you're in a situation where you can't handle the bleed or treat it effectively endoscopically, you could just do follow this with a TIPS procedure. This has been reported uh, by Sergei Kansavoy when he was at Johns Hopkins. Um, in this new methods report, a new alternative for a, a TIPS, EOS-guided creation of a uh, of a TIPS. And uh, here you can see he was using a, a wall stent. Um, he punctured the IVC, then punctured the portal vein down here, and then he placed the uh, wall uh, stent to bridge those two tubular structures. These are in 10 animals. So this was an animal study uh, of whom two he did survival work on for two weeks, and actually both of those animals did very well. Nonetheless, there are issues related to the stent. These stents, as you know, can shorten, and that may compromise the shunt. Uh, sometimes these stents are too long, and they can cause vessel wall injury. They can compress neighboring structures after their expansion. They can migrate, and they can thrombose. So it raised the, uh, the, the question whether maybe a shorter stent that really is just bridging the two vascular lumens and being lumen opposing can hold these two lumens in apposition with one another. So basically an application of the axial stent that you've seen used for pseudocyst drainage and um, a bile duct drainage, but could this also be used to create an intervascular uh, shunt? So uh, I did a, a proof of concept study. I, I haven't gotten around to publishing it yet. Uh, it's actually a, a few years ago already, um, where I created a transgastric, transhepatic portal systemic shunt. So the first step is to align the IVC and the portal vein. In the animal, in the pig, it's very hard to align the hepatic vein and the portal vein. So here I'm targeting the IVC, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the portal vein through the IVC here. Then I remove the needle, leaving a guide wire in place. Then I deploy the distal flange of the axial stent in the portal vein. And then all this is under ultrasound guidance, deploy the proximal flange in the IVC. And here on x-ray, you can see the axial stent bridging the IVC in the portal vein. This is what the video looks like. So through the IVC into the portal vein, you can see the tip of the needle in the 
portal vein. There was no hot axios at that time, so we had to first puncture with a standard 19 gauge FNA needle, put the guide wire in place. But afterwards, using the delivery catheter, which is very stiff, we were able to enter easily into the portal vein. Then we deployed the uh, distal flange in the portal vein, proximal flange in the IVC. You can see the two connected here. So here's the saddle in between. And uh, these are the necropsy photos. This was an acute study, so there was no survival in these animals. But you can see the axial stent nicely bridging the portal vein and the IVC. So obviously some modification would be needed uh, for this type of application, but at least the, the, there is a very nice proof of concept uh, in this animal model. So in conclusion, EOS guided vascular therapy is mainly indicated for refractory bleeding um, uh, or when endoscopic visualization is impaired. For gastric varices, I think EOS guided injection of cyanoacrylate glue has theoretical advantages over endoscopic guidance. And obviously, you know, we need uh, uh, trials uh, to demonstrate what those advantages are, randomized trials ideally. Placing a coil before injecting the glue at least theoretically should decrease the risk of glue embolization and may also improve the results of variceal obliteration. And the U.S. guided tips, it's technically feasible in the animal model and hopefully um, further work will be done maybe with modifications of this type of lumen opposing stent design. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. So, um, it, so the we have not always used the coils, though, uh, because down in the duodenum, the, there you're not you're less likely to encounter a large, you know, grape-like, you know, voluminous varix um, that's amenable to placing the coil first. These tend to be more of a kind of a convolute, a more tubular type of collaterals, really, and so there uh, it's important to get a good sense of which varix is likely to have bled. If you can find the feeder vessel, that's ideal. Um, but we have, but I have to say that there the challenge is that you often have a large number of collaterals. And so it just makes it more difficult. And Michael, I'm, you're, I know you've done a number of these duodenal ectopic varices. Did you? Yeah, I think they're a challenge. We've done duodenal and uh, na uh, nastomotic varices, pericolidophal varices, uh, rectal. And I do think they're smaller in caliber. Generally, have had to go with the 018 um, uh, needle and smaller uh, guide wire uh, and smaller coils, or they just simply won't fit. The other thing I try and do is anchor the wire. I'll actually go through the vessel, leave part of the, the coil, put most of it in the vessel, and then a little on both the outer aspect of the vessel. So, you know, if the vessel's here, you're putting some coil there, some below it, so it helps anchor it. But I do think they're uh, more difficult to treat and very difficult to find the feeding vessel, I think. Sorry, I'll get right to you. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a quick question about PFOs and whether patent frame and ovales are responsible for some of the more serious outcomes. And in your practice, do you require that the patients have cardiac ultrasound before? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, it's, again, sort of hitting a sensitive uh, nerve here because when I was in Hamburg, uh, I treated a child, now admittedly exsanguinating from uh, this, uh, I think it was like an eight-year-old child um, exsanguinating from esophageal varices, and uh, it was just a massive bleed, wasn't amenable to, we were doing sclerotherapy at the time, so we, um, we injected, I injected glue. This, this child had a patent foramen ovale, and as a result, the glue got into the arterial bloodstream and went to the brain, and so the, 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 the child uh, had a, a massive stroke after that. Um, fortunately, it, it, it recovered reasonably afterwards, but uh, it was just a... Uh, you know, the realization that a patent foramen ovale means that the glue really has access to the whole arterial system. So um, it's a great, good, good point to make. You know, I think as, lo as long as uh, the glue stays on the venous side, you're still relatively protected. 
Uh, as you saw, there's a, a high incidence of lung embolization, but these patients are usually asymptomatic. <coughs> Whether we can make it mandatory <laughs> to, to look for patent for patent for amyloid volley, I, I don't know. So, um, in your practice, do you do ultrasounds in all patients? No, we don't. No. And we, we're hopeful that by now using coil, and that has become our standard. You know, that is our protocol. We always place a coil unless the variceal varices are very small, where it really is too technically challenging to place little tiny coils. And, uh, and fortunately, we really haven't had, we haven't had any embolization that we've attributed to the procedure. We had that one case I told you, which was a week later, that we don't think was related to our procedure. Yes, so I think you had a question. Yeah, I just there. had a question. How about ischemia? You know, we always worry about that with interventional radiology. Have you, I can just varices. Have you seen any ischemic changes? Because that would be detrimental if something was to ulcerate, you know, ischemic and ulcerate. And yeah. So um, you can get some rebleeding as the so the the glue and the coil conglomerate are treated like a foreign body and it's mm -hmm. expelled from the from the varix and it leaves a scar plate behind. Um, I haven't seen ulceration though. Um, now, I have seen ulceration from glue injection done under endoscopic guidance. And the problem there is that if you get if you don't inject into the lumen of the varix, but you would inject paravariceal into tissue. The glue is very toxic to tissue. It's ulcerogenic, mm -hmm. and it can create horrible ulcers. Mm -hmm. And the ulcer, it's, in turn, can result in bleeding right. from the varics. Right. So that's another one of the challenges. As you know, you get more experience. You, you can feel when you're in the varics with your sclerotherapy needle, but that takes time. You, you're never sure, I, am I really in the varics lumen, or could I be alongside the varics? Yeah. With the U.S., it eliminates that guesswork, right? Yes, in the back. Thank you so much. Uh, two quick questions. Um, <clears throat> from a practical standpoint, how do you get uh, collaboration and buy-in from IR? I mean, our IR guys are very, very skilled, but they're also quite territorial, especially when you need to borrow coils from them. Well, we, we, we don't borrow <laughs> coils from yeah. them. <laughs> we okay. order okay. them directly from the manufacturer. Okay. Well, that, that solves one problem. Yeah. The, the other question I had was how to sort of practice a technique so that you don't damage your equipment. Yeah. So I think um, with glue, that's a very important question uh, and consideration uh, because you can destroy an endoscope within seconds uh, with, st with the standard glue. So that's part of my argument for considering something with a longer polymerization time, to give yourself more time. And what, what I do, um, I don't have it on the video, but I think I can show you this in the hands-on part tomorrow. Um, as, after I've injected the glue through the FNA needle, I advance the sheath forward a little bit so, it just, so that the tip has a safer distance away from the tip of the endoscope. Also, I might mention that when you use the CLA echoendoscope, there's a balloon over the transducer, and that also protects the transducer in case any glue should come in contact. Um, and that's really only, the only time you should see glue in the lumen is if, maybe you've somehow falsely injected the glue prematurely or it's under such high pressure that it exudes out of the puncture site, usually we don't see any glue at all in the lumen after the injection, EOS guided. So um, after we uh, finish the injection, advance the sheath a little bit forward, and then I just remove the whole echoendoscope. And then what the nurse will do is just wipe off the tip of the sheath and then we remove the sheath and, of course, check to make sure that the scope's okay. Little, you know, uh, common sense precautions like that are sufficient, I think, to avoid any damage to the scope. When treating gastric varices with injection technique, is there any clinical consideration or management difference between the varices formed in association with esophageal varices and liver cirrhosis compared to splenic vein thrombosis with isolated gastric varices? Yes, that's a great question. So firstly, if the patient has esophageal varices, um, I think the esophageal varices should be treated first unless you see stigmata of bleeding from the gastric varices, unless you think that a bleed occurred from the gastric varices. The reason why is because I've seen this repeatedly 
where I've treated esophageal varices and the gastric varices get worse. Never really made sense to me why that would occur. Sort of like, you know, if you plug your faucet and you live in an apartment complex and your faucet's clogged, you know, will the pressure in your neighbor's faucet go up? But I've seen it. So uh, I think the esophageal varices should be treated first and then uh, the gastric varices. Of course, the other reason maybe for treating the esophageal varices is that if you do a transesophageal access, uh, as I showed you, then obviously you want to avoid going through a large esophageal varix. Now, the next question, though, I think this is a very important one, is patients with splenic vein thrombosis. So these are patients that have these, often these huge splenorenal shunts. And uh, you need to be much more aggressive with these patients, with these large splenorenal shunts. So that's where you may be putting in multiple coils in sequence, but you're going to be putting in multiple coils with multiple aliquots of glue to adequately treat these. And this is where, I think at the, at the Mayo, right, don't you have the BRTO is uh, the what, balloon retrograde... Yeah, um, obliteration, yeah, yeah. And uh, we don't have that <laughs> at our institution, but there may be a role for that when you're dealing with patients who have these huge splenorenal shunts. Yes? You ever use silicone spray to protect your endoscope from uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, cyanoacrylate? So we haven't had to do that with Dermabond, but I think if you use the histoacryl, the n 2 cyanoacrylate, or Indermil, or number of manufacturers now, then yes, I would recommend that. Because that will help, help prevent the adherence to the, uh, to the shaft of the scope, as well as flushing through the working channel. Thank you again.